Hello, and welcome to the Atmospheric Sciences section, Jakob Bjorkney's lecture. My name is Jim Hurl, and for the past two years, I have had the pleasure and the honor of serving as president of the AGU Atmospheric Sciences section. And each year, this lecture is one of the highlights of the fall meeting. The Bjorkney's lecture is presented annually to a scientist who has made a major scientific impact in advancing the basic understanding of the atmosphere and Earth's climate. Established in 1993, this lecture honors the life of Jakob Bjorknes and his work in developing the basic theory of fronts, cyclogenesis, weather prediction, and creating quantitative models for forecasting. This year, it's a tremendous pleasure to introduce a good friend and a colleague Ruby Leung, to give the Bjorkney's lecture. Ruby received her PhD in atmospheric science from Texas A&M University in 1991. Today, she is a Battelle Fellow at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and she is the chief scientist of DOE's Energy Exascale Earth System Model, a major effort to develop state-of-the-art capabilities for modeling human Earth system processes. Ruby's research broadly cuts across multiple areas in modeling and analysis of climate and water cycle, including orographic precipitation, monsoon climate, extreme events, land surface processes, land atmosphere interactions, and aerosol cloud interactions. Ruby has published over 350 peer reviewed papers and many book chapters and reports. She has been a session chair and an invited speaker in many workshops and conferences, and organized several key workshops to define research needs and priorities in climate modeling and water cycle research. Presently, Ruby is a member of the National Academy's Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. She is a council member of the American Meteorological Society, and she is also serving as an editor for JGR Atmospheres and the Journal of Hydrometeorology. Among many honors she has received throughout her career, Ruby is an elected member of the National Academy of, Nas of Engineering and an elected member of the Washington State Academy of Sciences. She is also a fellow of the AGU, the American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's a true pleasure to welcome Ruby and congratulate her on this year's Bjorkney's lecture. Thank you all for watching and I am very sure you will enjoy Ruby's lecture. I'm deeply honored to be nominated and selected to deliver the Jacob Bjorkney's lecture this year. 2020 has been a very different year, but recording this lecture for the virtual AGU4 meeting is going to be a memorable experience for me. Understanding and modeling regional precipitation and the future changes has always been a fascinating challenge for me. So I'm going to take this opportunity in this lecture to discuss a few facets of our research in this particular topic. The research that I'm going to present is truly a culmination of teamwork that I have been very fortunate to be a part of. A central question we ask um, about regional precipitation is how will regional precipitation change in the future? So it has been almost uh, 20 years now uh, that we understand that global mean precipitation will increase with warming, but at a rate quite a bit lower than the, the rate with which water vapor increases with warming. Based on the clausius clapeyron relationship, we know that water vapor increases at roughly about 7% for each degree of warming. But global mean precipitation is balanced by evaporation, which is constrained by the surface energy balance. So this energy constraint dictates that global mean precipitation can only increase by roughly 2% for each degree of warming. So the big difference between these two numbers implies that when you think about the circulation, particularly the vertical motion that induces condensation and, pre and precipitation, that in global warming, the circulation must slow down. Besides global mean precipitation, extreme precipitation will also increase with global warming. 
And because extreme precipitation is produced in a weather event, so they don't need to be constrained by the overall long-term energy balance. So extreme precipitation can increase by almost as much as the increase of, of the water vapor, which is 7% for each degree of warming. In fact, extreme precipitation can increase by even more than that, because during extreme precipitation event, uh, the latent heat released by condensation can induce vertical motion, which can provide a positive feedback to further increase the precipitation during the extreme event. So this is a very nice figure showing that between the mean, which is the 50th percentile, and the extreme precipitation, like the 99.99 percentile, other percentile precipitation can increase by rate anywhere between 2% to 7% or more. So this understanding of how um, global mean precipitation and extreme precipitation will change under global warming is really useful. But we also have to recognize that regional precipitation, there's a lot of different features and things like that. So just knowing the global average is not good enough. Here I'm showing three regional precipitation regimes. These are the type of precipitation regimes that uh, we have been studying and um, they are also really important because they affect large world population. For example, monsoon precipitation has very strong seasonal cycle with wet summers and dry winters. Mediterranean precipitation also has very strong seasonal cycle, but almost just the opposite. They have a really wet winter, but dry summer. Mountain precipitation is also very important. Orographic forcing can produce abundant amount of precipitation in mountainous regions. And because mountains are at high elevation, the cold temperature means that oftentimes the precipitation will be accumulated on the ground as snowpack. And when the snowpack melt in spring and summer, the water is collected in the rivers and it, it can be delivered much further downstream and provide a water supply for large populations. So overall, there's a lot of challenges in predicting regional precipitation changes. And I'm going to highlight a few over here. As I mentioned before, there are diverse regional precipitation regimes. These regimes can have very different precipitation characteristics and the precipitation can also have very different generation mechanisms. When we talk about regional precipitation changes, they are often a result of a combination of thermodynamic and dynamic effect, meaning that it's not just controlled by the increase in the water vapor, but oftentimes circulation also changes. And that really complicates uh, the understanding of how regional precipitation changes. And also when we think about regional precipitation changes, um, they're often not that big compared to the large climatological variability. So this suggests that it, it would be rather difficult to detect, quantify and predict regional precipitation changes because of the small signal to noise ratios. And then lastly, um, there are many aspects of regional precipitation that are important for different reasons and they can change because of different mechanisms. For example, some might be interested in understanding the uh, change in the mean precipitation regionally or the variability, all sorts of variability from diurnal time scale to multi-decadal time scale, changes in extreme precipitation, changes in spatial pattern, frequency, intensity, etc. Much of water management is to reduce the disparity of water availability in space and time. Too much or too little, or too frequent or too rare, water management need this kind of information so that they can reduce the disparity. So because of these challenges, it would be really difficult to predict regional precipitation. So the question is, how can we meet the challenge of providing useful information on regional precipitation changes in the future? Precipitation is a key component of the water cycle. When we talk about the water cycle, we often visualize the water cycle in pictures like this, where they um, show you the cycling of water between the atmosphere, the land and the river and the ocean. 
energy cycle is of course also really important for the earth system. But oftentimes we look at the energy cycle in terms of this type of picture where they show you the vertical fluxes. So in looking at these um, views of water and energy cycle, we are often reminded that energy and water are really tightly connected, particularly through the surface energy and the surface water balance, particularly related to evaporation, which over here is the latent heating, and over here is evaporation in the water cycle. But maybe less frequently, we, don't, um, we often don't think of um, energy in terms of the flow. So here I found this really nice um, analysis uh, sh showing this um, atmospheric energy flow. So analogous to the flow of the water vapor, which is really important for understanding precipitation, the flow of atmospheric energy, or we call it just energy flow or atmospheric heat transport is also important for precipitation, particularly for the tropical region. So in the last 10 years or so, an energetic framework for understanding tropical precipitation and its changes has emerged and been developed. In the tropics, the atmosphere is nearly moist, adiabatic and stratified. So you can imagine uh, at, in the lower uh, atmosphere, uh, the Hadley circulation is converging moisture towards uh, the center. And then because of continuity, you can have rising motion and rising motion can produce clouds and precipitation. And as the air moves upward to the upper troposphere and gain a lot of potential energy, uh, this is where the moist static energy is actually highest near the upper troposphere. Therefore, the atmospheric heat transport is dominated by the upper branch of the Hadley circulation. So overall, when we consider the energy within this column of the um, tropical rig belt or the, or the um, uh, IDCZ, there is a net divergence of moist static energy. So now if we imagine a, an energy input to the northern hemisphere, such as during the boreal summer when the solar insulation is stronger, the IDCZ will shift over to the northern hemisphere. With, associated with this shift in the IDCZ, then there would be this southward cross equatorial energy transport. So this would transfer energy over to the southern hemisphere to rebalance the energy of the system. So in this energetic framework, the location of this IDCZ is really tightly connected to the cross equatorial energy transport. This can be clearly shown over here by a very nice figure by Biasuri et al, where they show in color shading over here, this is the atmospheric heat transport. The dashed lines here are the tropical precipitation and the green line here is the IDCZ. So over the annual cycle, you can see the IDCZ following this um, atmospheric transport really well. And it can be shown even more clearly when, when they plot the IDCZ latitude as a function of the cross equatorial energy flux. So over the annual cycle marked by these numbers corresponding to the month, you can see the movement of the, of the IDCZ corresponding to the change in the cross equatorial energy flux. So in this energetic framework, to understand the shifts in tropical precipitation, we need to understand the changes in the cross equatorial um, atmospheric heat transport. So I'm going to show you some examples of using this energetic framework to understand tropical precipitation changes, particularly related to the seasonal cycle as the seasonal cycle is really important uh, for tropical precipitation. So here we use a multi-model ensemble of simulations to look at uh, tropical precipitation. So in the Northern hemisphere between zero and 25 degree North, precipitation maximizes during summertime. When we look at the change in the future marked by the red curve here, we see a shift in the phase suggesting that there would be a phase delay under global warming. And this, is hap this happened not only over the northern uh, tropical region, but also over the southern tropical region. This seasonal delay can be thought of as the tropical precipitation stays in the colder hemisphere longer during the transition season before it moves over to the warmer hemisphere. Uh, 
This implies that there must be a change in the in the hemispheric energy difference, um, according to the um, energetic framework, and therefore there must also be a change in the atmospheric heat transport. So let's take a look to see if this is indeed the case based on the climate simulations. Uh, we use this um, energetic framework looking at the atmospheric heat equation. The divergence of the atmospheric heat transport is essentially a balance between the net energy input to the column of the atmosphere, which include energy coming from the lower uh, part as well as the energy coming from the uh, top of the atmosphere. And this is balanced by the tendency of the um, or the rate of change of the moist static energy, which has three components, the internal energy, the potential energy, and the latent energy. Uh, when we look at the divergence of the atmospheric heat transport in D, we see an interhemispheric difference when we compare springtime uh, with the summertime. But then we need to know whether this is related to the change in the net input of the energy or related to this tendency term. So here we see that within the boundary of the tropical region, we find this interhemispheric difference in the term related to the tendency of the moist static energy. And when we break down into the three terms here, we see that this is mainly associated with an interhemispheric difference in the tendency of the latent heating term. Because of the interhemispheric difference, it shifts the ITZZ over to the colder hemisphere. In this case, it's the southern hemisphere, and therefore delay the, uh, the transition of the tropical wind belt over to the northern hemisphere. So this is depicted uh, schematically over here. So during uh, springtime, the ITZZ stays in the southern hemisphere longer and therefore facilitating a cross equatorial atmospheric heat transport over to the uh, northern hemisphere. And why is this happening? Um, it can be easily understand as the fact that um, because, of a, because of warming, the atmosphere becomes moister and therefore to warm up the Northern hemisphere uh, for the summer, it needs more latent heating in order to do this. So having understood that it is the change in the uh, latent heat tendency that is causing the interhemispheric difference and the seasonal delay, we can uh, plug in the relationship of clausius clapeyron and derive a simple relationship over here to show that this term is actually rather simple. It scales linearly with global warming, and it also depends on the tendency of the climatological temperature. Um, the climatological temperature is, uh, the tendency is highest during the transition season, spring and fall, when the hemisphere is either warming up quickly or cooling down quickly. And during the peak summer or the, cold se or, or the winter season, this term is very small or near zero. So it is interesting that even though the energetic framework is a diagnostic framework, because of the understanding that this term is actually important, we can derive a predictive relationship. And this predictive relationship essentially says that in the far future, when the earth gets warmer and warmer, we would expect the um, seasonal delay to be larger and larger because it scales with the global mean uh, warming. On the other hand, if we have a climate that is getting colder, we would expect a seasonal advance rather than a seasonal delay. So um, since historically, uh, we already detected global warming in, uh, in the past uh, century or so. So a natural question for us to ask would be whether the seasonal delay that we are talking about, not only that we project this into the future, but has such a seasonal delay actually emerged in the observation? So in order to answer this question, we have been looking at five observational data sets during the satellite era from 1979 to 2019. So based on these five uh, observational data sets, we see that um, averaging over land in the Northern hemisphere between zero and 25 degree, precipitation maximizes in the summertime. But looking at the long-term trend, we see a reduction um, during the early wet season and an increase during the later wet season. So this is the signature of the seasonal delay showing that even in the observational record in the last 40 years, we have already seen the emergence of the seasonal delay. 
To help us understand this seasonal delay, we look at a large number of climate simulations for the historical period. In fact, we look at a total of 243 simulations from two multimodal ensembles, CIMIP-5 and CIMIP-6, as well as three large ensemble simulations from three different models. All of these simulations are driven by external forcing, including greenhouse gases, aerosols, and land use land cover change. These simulations show that uh, indeed there, ha there, there, there has been a reduction of precipitation in the early wet season and an increase in precipitation in the later season corresponding to the observation. We can also take a look at the time series. So here I'm showing two um, uh, areas. The first is averaging over land in the Northern hemisphere. And then we also particularly look at the Sahara. In this figure, the black curve is based on observation and the red curve is based on the average of over 200 simulations. So we see that both observation and the model simulation show an increasing trend in the phase corresponding to a phase delay. And then looking at the magnitude of the trends, we can say that external forcing explains probably more than 50% of the observed delay that we see in the, in the record. So we can actually look at this even regionally. So here we show a spatial distribution of the long-term trend over the 41 years based on observation, and then also based on the model simulation with external forcing. It's interesting to see many areas such as uh, the, um, the Central America, uh, Sahara, and part of Asia, uh, we see this delay in the seasonal phase. And, but also importantly, we see that the model simulation basically capture a lot of these regional feature, suggesting that these simulations would be very useful to help us understand the seasonal delay. So now let's take a look at these simulations. Again, over the two regions, Northern Hemisphere land and also Sahau. Uh, we see that over averaging over land in the Northern Hemisphere, greenhouse gases um, play a a more important role, uh, although aerosols also play a role as well. Similarly, in the Sahara, both aerosols and greenhouse gases play a role, but here aerosols playing a more important role. So let's take a look at uh, these simulations that are isolating the effect of greenhouse gases and the effect of aerosols in the two regions. Here we look at a longer time period from pre-industrial all the way to now. We see that in the Northern Hemisphere land, there has been an increase in the phase, and this is corresponding to a phase delay, suggesting that greenhouse gases warm up the temperature in the northern hemisphere, and as a result, it causes a phase delay. But interestingly, if we look at the last 40 years or so, we see a, a larger trend, uh, suggesting that this trend is corresponding to the more rapid increase in the warming due to the larger increase in the greenhouse gases. Over the Sahara, this is interesting to see that uh, based on the aerosol forcing, we actually see a phase advance instead of a phase delay. And this is understandable because anthropogenic aerosols essentially causes um, a cooling in the surface and therefore this is causing a phase advance. This is what happened over a long time period, but if we only look at the last 40 years, we see that this trend is reversed, suggesting that due to the reduction of emissions of anthropogenic aerosols. Uh, the earth has, uh, in the Sahara, the area has actually warmed up and therefore uh, causing a phase uh, delay. So now an important question is, can we use the energetic framework to understand this? So here we plot the divergence of the atmospheric heat transport for the two region. And we do indeed see really, really good correspondence uh, with the phase changes over long time period, as well as over the last 40 years in both the Northern Hemisphere and also over the Sahara region. Further looking into this uh, divergence of the atmospheric heat transport, we see that indeed this is due to the change in the tendency of the latent heating as we discussed before based on the future projection. So this is showing us that the energetic framework is indeed very useful. Uh, it helps us to understand the changes of the seasonal cycle and also it works quite well, not only for zonal averages, but even for regional averages, such as over the Sahara and over the land in the Northern hemisphere. 
and it is also useful uh, to help us understand uh, the uh, forcing, the, uh, the response to the different forcings. So the energetic framework has been used already in many studies to look at how tropical precipitation respond to different type of forcing like greenhouse gases, aerosols, orbital forcing, etc. But it's important to recognize that even though over the tropical region, the IDCC is definitely the most uh, out, uh, standing out type of feature, a zonally symmetric feature, and therefore the energetic framework is able to explain, mostly used to explain the uh, latitudinal movement of the IDCZ. But if we are interested in the regional monsoon, we see important zonal asymmetry in the tropical precipitation that we should also uh, understand. And so for this, a very nice study by Booth and Cordy extended the energetic framework from one dimension to two dimension. So essentially they introduced this concept of energy flux potential. So using, using this concept, you can take a look at the atmospheric heat transport in two dimension where the V over here is a vector. So this is uh, pictorially depicted here. So you can see the energy transport and the um, energy flux potential. And they apply this to also look at, for example, the difference between El Nino and La Linea year, where there is a shift, a east-west shift in the energy flux potential. And as a result, you can see a east-west shift in the precipitation. So this extension of the energetic framework to two dimension is really useful. And recently we have also followed uh, this line of research and take a look at that. And we find quite interestingly that in a simulation where we calculated the energy, um, the energy uh, flux and the divergence, and if we take the moist static energy and the net energy input based on this simulation and use an energy balance model, we can actually predict the divergent heat transport quite well. And this simple energy balance model is simply assuming that the transport of energy is, is simply a down gradient diffusion. It is surprising actually to see that it works really well. So here we show the model simulated uh, divergent energy flux. And here is the uh, predicted divergent energy flux based on this simple energy balance model. Emphasizing that the concept of energy is important um, and it can be very useful for understanding uh, precipitation. So, um, but of course, let's uh, move back to here first. Um, for this framework to be useful, we also need to uh, understand what actually control the moist static energy and the net energy input. So I would argue that looking at a picture like this um, of clouds, a satellite picture, you can see that clouds are ubiquitous. And so they have really significant control on the planetary albedo, as well as the long wave, uh, outgoing long wave radiation. And therefore they would have really important effect on the net energy input. It is also important to recognize that different types of convection converge moisture at different level and diverge moist static energy at different level. So it is also important to recognize different types of convection. So carrying this idea a little bit further, I would, I would also argue that among the different types of convection in clouds, mesoscale convective systems would be a really key element of understanding energy and water cycles. This is because mesoscale convective systems or MCS, they are really ubiquitous, um, especially in the tropical region. They, they are the deepest, uh, the, the, the largest form of deep convection. Typically they have horizontal dimensions of hundreds to thousands of kilometers and they can last pretty long, 10 to 24 hours. If you look at a mature MCS cross section, you can see deep convective core, but you can also see a really expensive area of stratiform cloud producing stratiform precipitation. Because of this, um, the heating profile associated with mesoscale convective system usually display this kind of top heavy heating profile. And therefore they would have a very large Im impact on the moist static energy export uh, in, the, in the atmospheric column. And they also have large impacts on the upper tropospheric circulation. So in order to better understand mesoscale convective systems, we have devoted quite significant effort to develop data sets as well as developing models. So here I'm showing you our effort to develop a global MCS data set. 
um, we take advantage of high spatial and temporal resolution satellite data. So this is a satellite data of cloud top infrared radiation, as well as the GPM iMERGE precipitation available at hourly frequency and 10 kilometer resolution. So using these data sets combined with a MCS tracking method that we developed called a flex tracker, we are able to track the cold cloud shield corresponding to these expensive stratiform area. We also track the precipitation beneath the cold cloud shield. And based on these features, we can track MCS and we develop a global data set covering between 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north for 20 years. So using the MCS mask uh, at 10 kilometer resolution, we can build a lot of statistics of MCS, like the location, the time, their lifetime size, rainfall, et cetera. And this kind of information is helpful for us to understand MCS characteristics, as well as developing data sets that we can use to evaluate models. So here I'm showing you four characteristics of MCS that would be of interest. Uh, for example, MCS number. For this, you can see over the tropical area, uh, the number is highest, particularly along the IDZZ, also in the Amazon, Sahel, uh, Indian Ocean, as well as the Western Pacific. We also look at the contribution of MCS precipitation to the total precipitation. Looking at this particular metric, uh, the Sahel really stand out. So this is the area where between 70 to 80% of the precipitation is derived from MCS. By tracking MCS, we can also build statistics of MCS lifetime. So if we look at the tropical region like the IDZZ, et cetera, we see regions where MCS ha has lifetime of up to like uh, tw uh, two days. And then by tracking MCS, we can also look at MCS translation speed. Over the tropics, they follow the easterly winds, and then over the mid-latitude region, they follow the westerly winds. With this MCS data set, we can also combine the data with other data sets such as the GPM precipitation feature, as well as uh, multiple products of latent heating. So combining these data, then we can derive the MCS latent heating. And here I'm showing you the vertical profile of the latent heating, showing that over the tropical region, the MCS latent heating peaks at around eight kilometer. Here I'm showing a horizontal distribution of uh, the fraction of MCS latent heating contributed by heating between four kilometer and eight kilometer, which we can call top heavy uh, type of uh, latent heating. And here again, the Sahel really stand out as the region where you see a large fraction between 80%, um, 60 to 80% of the MCS latent heating comes from this part, four kilometer and eight kilometer. We can also take a look at um, the stratiform ring fraction. We know that uh, for different types of MCS, the higher the stratiform ring fraction they produce, the more top heavy the heating profile would be. So we can see uh, two different types of uh, MCS. For example, MCS with stratiform ring fraction larger than 70% in black, showing much heavier, top heavier type of heating versus uh, MCS with stratiform ring fraction between 70 to uh, 30 to 70%. So here we show the uh, horizontal distribution for these two types of MCS. You can see that over the tropics um, in the ocean area, uh, uh, most of the areas have over, um, over like around 60, 50 to 60% of the MCS uh, produce this type of um, between 30 to 70% um, stratiform uh, heat uh, uh, rainfall. And then over, uh, particularly in the tropical land area, you can see uh, between 40 to 50% of the MCS, they produce more than 70% of stratiform ring fraction. So these would be the areas where you would expect more often MCS producing really top heavy heating profile. We also see in some regions over the mid latitude where a large fraction of the MCS produce, very, produce really heavy, um, top heavy heating profile. Besides looking at uh, heat, uh, latent heating, we are also interested in how much um, MCS contribute to the mass transport. So for this, uh, we perform a simulation, a conduction permitting simulation at 4.5 kilometer grid spacing. We demonstrated that this simulation 
performs really well in, in producing MCS characteristics and then applying MCS tracking to the data, to the model output, we can identify MCS. We can also identify deep connection that is not MCS and we simply call them non-MCS. We can also identify congestus clouds as well as shallow connection. So let's take a look at these four types of connection and how they contribute to the mass transport at three different altitudes. So at the low altitude 1.5 kilometer, we see that um, all of these uh, different convection types contribute to mass transport. But in the mid and the upper troposphere, MCS dominates the, the mass transport compared to all these other types of um, convection. We can see this even more clearly when we look at the vertical profile here, uh, the red color for MCS show that MCS produce the majority of the mass transport compared the, to these three other types of convection. And also the convection, um, uh, the overturning circulation produced by the MCS reaches a really high top near like 13 kilometer. Non-MCS deep convection also can transport to pretty high up not quite as high as 13 kilometer. And they also show kind of like a more a top heavy kind of profile. Congestus clouds contribute to uh, overturning and the mass transport mostly in the mid and the lower troposphere and shallow convection mostly contribute to mass transport in, below uh, two kilometer. And then above in the clear sky, we see subsidence over there. And an interesting question to ask would be, what about if you compare per MCS event versus per non-MCS dip convection. How do they compare in terms of the mass, moisture, and moist static energy transport? And this is what I'm showing over here for MCS and for non-MCS dip convection. In order to look at the vertical profile clearly, I actually have to use very different um, horizontal scale because they actually differ by almost like a hundred times. So, but we can see clearly the vertical profile um, for MCS is definitely much more uniform vertically and it reaches um, to very high altitude, transporting mass and moist static energy. For non-MCS, deep convection, the magnitude is much smaller, but it, it does have a kind of like a more top heavy kind of profile. So overall, if we look at per event, MCS vertical transport of mass, water and energy is between 70 to 100 times that of non-MCS deep convection. So an interesting question would be if a climate model cannot simulate MCS, it has to produce so many non-MCS deep convection in order to make up for this type of overturning circulation for the mass transport, moisture transport and energy transport. And what might that do to the climate simulations would be interesting to study. Um, now we have many different data sets. We can also use data sets to look at this. For example, we are comparing two reanalysis. The ERA5 reanalysis had higher resolution of roughly 25 kilometer compared to the ERA interim. So using isentropic analysis, we can calculate the mass um, overturning circulation uh, and the mass transport. And so comparing these two, we're breaking up breaking down or decomposing the total mass transport into large scale versus mesoscale. Mesoscale here means less than a thousand kilometer. We see differences between the two reanalysis data set and this difference is mainly contributed by mesoscale overturning. At higher resolution, ELA5 shows that there is more mesoscale overturning. In fact, this reanalysis showed that mesoscale overturning is almost like 74% of the large scale overturning in the tropics. Again, showing that mesoscale processes are really important in the tropics in contributing to the overturning and the, and the transport, vertical transport. So now let's take a look even at more local scale that MCS would be really important for precipitation as well. So here we're looking at the central United States, looking at MCS. Um, we see that MCS is quite different from non-MCS deep convection in that MCS produces more intense rain with larger rain area. Because of the more intense rain in the larger area, MCS rain can produce larger soil moisture anomalies and, and gradients of soil moisture anomalies. So because of this, these gradients of the soil moisture can induce circulation to converge moisture towards dry soil patches and produce non 
MCS precipitation. At the same time, because MCS produce very intense rain, this intense rain can percolate deeper into the soil layer where they have longer memory. And therefore the soil moisture being stored in the uh, deeper layer can constantly uh, provide a source of water vapor and contribute to MCS rainfall during summertime. So this is showing that MCS is really important in soil moisture precipitation feedback for both non-MCS and, no and MCS rain um, in the summertime. So having talked about all this importance of um, MCSs, we have to recognize that climate models really normally have a tough time in simulating MCSs. So in an effort to help us better develop tools that we can use to advance the energetic framework, um, the Department of Energy, Energy Exascale Earth System Model, we have devoted significant effort in developing global cloud resolving model. So this is showing a simulation with the non-hydrostatic um, dynamical core. Um, in this simulation, it's a global simulation at three kilometer. This is with simple physics, but recently we have also performed simulations with full physics globally at three kilometer, showing quite comparable simulation in, in our model compared to Yao A5. We have also pursued a, a parallel path where we uh, implement the super parameterization in the E3SM model. Uh, so embedding a cloud resolving model within the GCM grid cell. So we are hoping that this approach can also be a viable approach for us to better simulate conduction, especially uh, mesoscale conductive systems. For this type of model to be really useful for understanding energy, we need to be able to do simulations for at least like decades, if not century long. So in order to do this, this type of model must run effectively on very big computers such as exascale computer. And we know that a viable path for exascale computer is um, GPU. And therefore this project has also devoted significant effort in developing GPU enabled model. So here I'm showing you some uh, uh, benchmarks over here. So we have uh, performed simulation using the E3SM non-hydrostatic die core on this machine, the summit machine, which has lots of GPU cores. And using this NGGPS three kilometer benchmark, we are able to get a performance of close to one simulation year per day compared to previous efforts in other models running on different machine. So with this type of um, one close to one simulation year per day, but of course this is using simple physics, uh, with this type of performance, uh, we are hopeful that it would be really feasible for us to do multi-decade long type of simulations in the future. Our project is also actively um, uh, porting the physics parameterizations to run on GPU machines as well. So in summary, um, I have talked about um, the importance of understanding regional precipitation and predicting its future changes. I think that they can benefit from understanding the, uh, the connection between energy and water. I have demonstrated that the energetic framework is useful for understanding tropical precipitation and its response to forcing. I use the example of the seasonal delay in the tropical precipitation. And I also show that even though the energetic framework is a diagnostic framework, but the insights we gain from diagnostic framework can still be very useful for us to develop predictive relationships, such as the one I show that the um, phase delay will be linearly scaling with the global mean warming. Um, we also show that um, in order to further advance the energetic framework we, for prediction, we need to better understand what controls the energy distribution because we are saying that the shift of the tropical precipitation, whether the latitudinal shift or the east-west shift would be uh, controlled by the distribution of the MSE and the net energy input. And for this, I argue that cloud and convection would be really important and particularly over the tropical region, mesoscale convective system would be really important because they are dominating the, uh, the latent heating in the tropics. So we really need to address this important puzzle. But I've also shown you that um, we have now developed new data sets. There are new satellite data sets. There are new techniques to track MCS 
um, combine different data sets, et cetera. We also have modeling tools that allow us to really run a simulation, potentially multi-decade long simulations at um, cloud resolving scale. And these can help support our quest for better understanding and modeling regional precipitation. But I have provided a really atmospheric centric view. <laughs> Going beyond atmospheric centric view, uh, we really need to understand that ocean and land are really important. Um, the fact that we talk about mostly the atmosphere is because the energy and the moisture in the atmosphere is the direct um, part that affect precipitation. But this energy transport and the moisture transport is very much affected by the ocean and the land and the interactions with the atmosphere. So going forward, I think this energetic framework would be very much challenged in terms of understanding the whole couple system and how to incorporate that kind of understanding in, in the energetic framework. So I want to thank you very much for paying attention. And I want to um, acknowledge um, the US Department of Energy, the Office of Science, Biological and Environmental Research for supporting our research, uh, particularly through three different projects that I have um, selected some uh, research highlight. Uh, the region and regional and global model analysis program has been supporting our water cycle and climate extremes modeling scientific focus area. The Earth System Model Development Program has been supporting the Energy Exascale Earth System Model, or U3SM. And then the Exascale Computing Project has been supporting our effort in superparameterization, called the Cloud Resolving Climate Modeling of the Earth's Water Cycle. So with that, again, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ruby. That was uh, that was terrific. Thank you. You can hear me, right? Can you hear me? I can hear you. We have a couple okay, of questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but uh, I think it's Tyamir Kostanov has a question. Is there a clear predicted or observed effect of global warming on phasing of mid-latitude precipitation. Yeah, so this is interesting because um, we have uh, performed some analysis of uh, climate model projections and also looking at the seasonal cycle, how the seasonal cycle of precipitation change in the mid-latitude. What I show in this lecture is mainly about the seasonal cycle changes um, in a tropical precipitation. Over the mid-latitude, instead of a phase delay, what we found is in some regions such as California, we are seeing a sharpening of the seasonal cycle of precipitation with a shorter wet season. So, so it, um, it's interesting to see that um, in different parts of the world for different reasons, uh, global warming can, uh, can cause a change in the seasonal cycle of precipitation, but it's not necessarily only causing a phase delay. It can be in different forms such as a shortening of the wet season. Okay, um, we have a question from Steven Schwartz. Uh, some years ago, there was a paper on the effect of climate change on the yield of Durham wheat in Tuscany, which I have always considered a poster child of drawing conclusions between our understanding. But perhaps your energy framework will be able someday to address that question. What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, to really predict like uh, crop changes or something like that uh, means that you have to have a good prediction of regional precipitation. And that's really regional if you are talking about like Tuscany, a, a small region um, within Italy. Um, uh, certainly, I mean, our goal is to be able to make prediction uh, at regional scale, maybe even down to that kind of scale. Uh, but uh, I think there is still a way to go. Um, definitely the energy framework is helpful, especially in a tropical region. Um, so that's why um, I have been uh, discussing about this um, energetic framework. Um, ultimately, we hope that uh, not only by using the energetic framework, but um, with improvements in models and things like that, uh, better understanding the energy, the connection between energy and water, that we would continue to improve our understanding and modeling of regional precipitation changes.
Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Zhang, Zhang Xing Li. Are seasonal delays consistent for all four? Seems like we lost um, Paul, is that right? Okay, I, I can see the, I don't know whether I should <laughs> just go ahead and answer the, the question. I can see the question. So I think this question is from Zhang Qing Li and he asks, are seasonal delays consistent for all four? Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, so Paul, would you like? Okay, so let me go ahead and, a and answer the question. So um, yeah, so the seasonal delay uh, essentially, um, it, depending on whether you are looking at the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you see the same delay. So, so it is a delay, uh, let's say from spring to the summer season, and then it is uh, further carry over to the other season. Okay. Um, we, we have a question. Could you comment on the importance of observations and how the lack of measurements, mainly in the tropics, could affect predictions? Um, yes, observations, definitely important, uh, especially for the fact that I have been trying to make a connection between energy and water. So uh, observations are important for us to understand the energy transport. And, and in fact, I think this is something that we would like to be able to pay more attention to in the future is that when we uh, evaluate climate models, not only we focus on looking at precipitation, which is a product of many different processes, I think it's also important for us to be able to evaluate how well models um, simulate the energy transport um, or this type of quantity. So, uh, Clearly, observations are important to understand the energy transport as well as to help us better quantify um, the biases in model and how we can improve uh, model simulation of energy and the energy transport. Okay, thanks. Um, Guiling Wang has another question. Could you please comment on how seasonal phase change may play a role in the 20th, 20th Sahel drought? Um, you mean the the Sahel drought in the in in the past few decades, or is that? Um, yeah, I think he means the twentieth century Sahel drought. Okay, um, so the seasonal delay uh, we are particularly focusing on the energy difference um, or the interhemispheric energy difference, right, between the two seasons. Um, the Sahel drought itself is not just about a delay, uh, it, it is actually a, a reduction in the precipitation. So I think there is some connection, but there's more to the seasonal delay um, in, in, in the Sahel drought. So a uh, question from uh, Mavendra Dubé. You have focused on MCS and precipitation. Any thoughts on moisture in the UTLS? Um, so I, I show some results looking at the moisture transport and the energy, the mass and the moisture transport by mesoscale convective systems. Uh, definitely mesoscale convective systems, uh, they can carry moisture to pretty high altitude. So, so they would play a pretty important role in the moisture in the upper troposphere, yes. Okay, a uh, question from Ala Yolanda Sarah. How do we best use models to help design observational networks, or do we know already what observations are needed and where? Um, okay, I kind of lost the sound a little bit. I think your question is how we might be able to combine model together or use model to help us design 
how we might make measurement. Is that is that the question? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, yes, I think models can be useful in that sense uh, because models, after all, are physically based and they do help us understand um, where uh, information would be more useful. Uh, yeah, so 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 in a sense, I I, I think that this. This is useful and, and has been done in some ways uh, using models to help us determine, for example, where at what location you might need more data as well as sampling issues and things like that. Okay, thanks. Um, another question from Jose Martinez Claros. You mentioned that in the tropics, vertical ascent is nearly moist adiabatic. How closely is this related to the near zero buoyancy, buoyancy sorting mechanism that has been proven to be useful as a mass flux scheme, particularly for MCS? Yeah, I think this is related. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh -huh. uh, the moist adiabatic, uh, uh, near moist adiabatic profile definitely is related to um, conduction that is helping to carry the moisture uh, around so I, I think there's a connection to that okay uh, another question um, from uh, Hong Jiang Yan from an engineering perspective are the advances in regional precipitation change and mechanism understanding from climate models sufficient to inform water resources management and hydrologic engineering if not, what is the gap now? Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> I think this is ultimately what we hope to be able to answer. Um, I think that there have been um, understanding um, related to changes in precipitation and water resources. For example, um, changes in snowpack um, in the mountain, which is more, re which are more related to both precipitation change and temperature change. Some of these uh, changes, we have more uh, better understanding, or models have more robust uh, prediction for. But of course, there are also uh, certain aspects of uh, precipitation changes and changes in runoff and soil moisture and things like that that are less robust uh, from the models as well as uh, we have uh, under uh, less understanding so in a sense i don't think that we can say uniformly that uh, models are good enough in, to be used for water resources management i think it depends on what kind of precipitation regimes, what kind of hydrologic regimes we are talking about. I, I, I think that in mountainous area, particularly those that are affected by snowpack and things like that, that, would, that are more influenced by the thermodynamics, I think we do have a bit more confidence in the, in, in the projections coming from the models as well as, as our understanding. I'm hoping that Paul will be back. <laughs> Can you hear me, hear me Ruby? <laughs> yes, uh-huh.
Ah, okay. Uh, one, one, one last question from Bernard okay. McGross. Is the phase delay discernible as a systematic trend in the Indian monsoon onset, or is it lost in the variability? Um, well, I have shown some results based on analysis of observation, and, and in those results, um, we have seen uh, some uh, signal over uh, the Indian monsoon as well, um, although uh, when we average over the northern hemisphere land as well as over the Sahel, the signals are more clear. Uh, but, but there is a picture showing the regional distribution of the trend, and we do see some signals over the Indian monsoon. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Ruby. Uh, this is terrific. Um, and congratulations again on uh, being the, the lecturer this year, the Buchness lecturer. Um, I want to uh, thank everybody who's attended today. And I'm sorry for the connection problems, but um, we'll see if we can get those sorted out for the next lecture. So thank you again, Ruby. And everybody have a nice evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah.